What is the science behind obedience and disobedience? Why do people obey and why do they disobey? Why do we struggle with doing what we should do with what God wants us to do? How are we tempted and how does God lead us? Some of your old timers, you'll remember the old cartoons where a character would be being tempted and he would have a little demon on one shoulder and this little demon would have horns and a pitchfork and a tail would look like him and he would be telling him to do the wrong thing. And then on his other shoulder would be a little angel who had a halo and wings and maybe a harp and he would be telling him to do the right thing. Today you're going to see how that depiction is pretty much biblically accurate. What is this thing called the flesh? Is it possible to think that you're having some sort of God moment and it not be a God moment at all? Is it possible to think that you're worshiping God and not really be worshiping God at all? Or worse, is it possible to think that you're worshiping God when you're in fact serving yourself? The answer to that question is yes. In Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Jesus says that many, his words, not mine, who think that they're going to heaven or not. These people say that they're Christians. They talk Christian talk. They even do Christian things. But in the end, they find out they were not true believers. They were not genuine Christians. They didn't actually follow Christ. In this message, in the one or two to follow, you'll see how it's possible to be deceived about this. I want to talk to you today about understanding you. You're going to learn about how God created you, how he leads you and works in you, and how the devil tempts you and controls you. You're going to learn why your mind is the battlefield of your soul and why it must be renewed. This message is about the difference between our bodies, our souls, and our spirits. The best explanation I can give on the subject was written by a Chinese believer in the last century who was persecuted, arrested, and died in a communist prison. He was such a big deal in China that Christians, in order to be safe, not only had to renounce Christ, they had to renounce Watchman Nee. After his death, Nee was actually recognized by the U.S. Congress. Like Paul, he spent a lot of time in prison writing books. Unlike Paul, Nee was not right about every single thing he wrote. Hebrews 1.11 says that God spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Notice the many portions statement. God gives different spokesmen of his different amounts of light or revelation on different subjects. Paul had the broadest grasp of most subjects. Peter had the corner kind of on suffering. James told us the most about the connection between works and salvation. John had the biggest uh, amount of revelation on the end of times, wrote a book on it. Now, I don't agree with everything Nee believed and wrote, but I think God gave him great insight on this topic at hand. His three-volume set called The Spiritual Man is his most thorough explanation of this subject. I'm guessing it's uh, between seven and 800 pages total. I'll quote him several times in this message because of how well he explains this. So let's get going. In your outline, number one, God is triune in nature. He's triune in nature. One under that, God is a father. Number two, God is a son. Number three, God is a spirit. God is three persons in one, all distinct, yet completely the same in essence, nature, and character. You may ask, how could God be three and be one? God is beyond our ability to imagine him. He is incomprehensible. We only know about him what he chooses to reveal about himself. And I'm, and I'm under the impression we only have a drop in the ocean of who God really is. If you have a God that you can totally understand and explain, you made that God up in your own mind. The Bible says no one has seen God the Father. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. The Holy Spirit is God or Jesus in us. He is a trinity. He is triune. He is three in one. Now, number two, man has a triune nature. We are created in the image of God. We have a triune nature. Genesis 2, 7 says, The Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. 
So man is, number one, man has a body. He has a body. God took something physical, the dust, and created a physical body. He has a body. His, with, his, with our bodies, we are world conscious, conscious of the world. We see, we hear, we taste, we touch, we physically feel. Number two, man has a soul. Man was created when God breathed life into him. Our souls give us self-consciousness. Your soul is what makes you, you. It's your personality. It's often used interchangeably with the word life or self in Scripture. Number three, man has a spirit. Man received a spirit when God breathed into him. Breath and wind are often used as a symbol of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Our spirit gives us God consciousness. It's where we relate to God. We are spiritually dead, according to Ephesians 2.1, because our spirits are dead, cut off, separated from God. And we're dead until we're born again. God's spirit, big S, comes to live inside of our spirit, little s, and that makes us spiritually alive, reborn, regenerated. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, it says, May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And he tells us what entirely is. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man is triune in nature, spirit, soul, body. Man's flesh includes his physical desires and his damaged soul. His flesh is his physical desires and his damaged souls. In the New Testament, you read all the time about the flesh, being in the flesh versus in the spirit. Now just listen to some of these verses. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 gives us some of the deeds of the flesh. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. In other words, it's not an exhaustive list. Uh, and things like these of which I forewarn you that I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. James 4, 1 to 2 tells us that our desires, what we want, are our problem. Our desires, what we want, are our problem. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. In Matthew 15, 18 to 19, Jesus tells us that who we are, what we think and feel, is our problem. Who we are, what we think and feel, is our problem. He says this, the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, who we are. And those defile the man, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and slanders. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9 reminds us that how we think is not how God thinks. And that what we do is like how we think is our problem. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For the, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your thoughts, and uh, ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Am I still cutting out? Oh, we're not. Okay, good deal. All right, so under that, I've got four things. Number one. Our, because of that, our, we're talking about our flesh, our desires are distorted. In other words, our wanters are broken. We want what we ought not want, and we don't want what we ought to want. Typically, because of our broken nature, the flesh, the more forbidden the fruit is, the more compelling the temptation is. You want, you want your uh, young kid not to do something, tell them, uh, or want them to do something, tell them they can't. If you want them not to do something, tell them they can. Because if, if they're not supposed to, there's something in us that makes us want to do it. Galatians 5.17 says, The flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Listen to Romans 7.14-15-19. to 15 and 19. Paul says, I am a flesh sowed into bondage to sin. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. For I'm not practicing what I'd like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. For the good that I want, I do not do, 
but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Our desires are distorted in our flesh, in our old nature. Again, we want what we ought not want, and we don't want what we ought to want. Now, number two, our emotions are deceitful. Our emotions are deceitful. We're going to spend a lot of time here. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else. That means than everything else. Nothing is more deceitful than our emotions. And it says it's desperately sick, which is the word used of the baby when David and Bathsheba had the affair. If you remember, the baby that they conceived died. And before it died, they said that it was sick, and this is the word it used. It means it was terminally sick. He says, who can understand it? Now listen closely. The Christian life is not to be lived out of the soul, but out of the spirit. We don't follow God because we feel him. We follow God because we know him. We don't obey God because we feel like doing so. We obey God whether we feel like it or not. Feelings can be a nice, occasional byproduct of loving the Lord. But they're never, never, never to be the basis of our loving Him or following Him. There are times when God will give you the blessing of feeling loved by Him. How many of you have felt that sometimes? Just some circumstance, some event, some something, you just think, gosh, I feel so loved by God. God will give you that sometimes. But God wants you to move past the need to feel loved and bring you to the point where you believe in his love. When you believe in his love, you do not have to feel his love. If you think him loving you is only true when you feel it, then I promise you, you're going to spend a lot of your life thinking God doesn't love you. I'll say that again. There are times when God will give you the blessing of feeling loved by him. But God wants to move you past the need to feel loved by him where you believe in his love for you. There are times when you will say, God is good. And you feel it and mean it. There are other times when you wonder, how could a good God let this go on? Am I in the right room? Now, next Sunday, we're going to tell you about our trip to Africa and and, and kind of something we didn't have planned, but God did. We ended up going to a dump and watching people stand underneath the garbage truck as it poured out so they could get something to eat. None of us will ever forget it. When you see some of these pictures, I hope you'll never, ever forget it. Do you think those people feel like God is good? When they're competing with baboons for the stuff you didn't want to eat on your plate three or four days later? Think they felt loved by God? A lot of us have this Western culture uh, Christianity that fits real good in a prosperous society. But it's not worth a nickel if you get it, out, get it into a third world poverty. It's not worth a nickel. Joel Osteen doesn't sell there. Real Christianity does. But not what we pretend and try to make it to be here. You'd better believe in God's love for you because there's going to be times you won't feel it. You'd better come to believe that God is good because there'll be times when it seems like God is not good at all. At least not at this moment, not in this circumstance. That's why the Bible makes it clear in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 that we, don't, we walk by faith, not by sight. What is walking by sight? It's, it, I see it, I feel it, I understand it. What is walking by faith? I trust what God has said, even though what I'm seeing looks contradictory and what I'm feeling is completely contradictory. That is walking by faith. In Hebrews 11, without faith, it is what? It is impossible to please God. It's not hard. It's not difficult. It's impossible. Walking by faith is walking in the Spirit. Little s driven by big S. Walking by sight is walking in the soul. 
was, oh, God was there this morning. I felt him. When we sang that song, oh, the hair just came up on the back of my neck. God was there. Let me tell you, a lot more than God can put hair up on the back of your neck. Watchman Nee says this. The soul is affected by outside influences, but not the spirit. For example, when the soul is provided with beautiful scenery, serene nature, inspiring music, and many other phenomena pertaining to the external world, it can be moved instantly and respond strongly. Not so the spirit. If the spirit of believers is flooded with the power of the Holy Spirit, it is independent of the soul. Unlike the latter... The spirit does not require outside stimuli by which to be activated, but is able to be active on its own initiative. It can move under any circumstance. Hence, those who are genuinely spiritual can be active whether their soul has any feeling or their body has any strength. End of quote. He says in another place, those who are soulish who try to live their lives out of the soul... I think and feel, I choose. Those who are soulless usually thrive on sensation. The Lord affords them the sense of his presence before they attain spirituality. Before they attain it. They treat such a sensation as their supreme joy. Boy, didn't you just feel God today? That was added in. When granted such a feeling, they picture themselves as making huge strides toward the peak of spiritual maturity. I must be close to God. Wow, what I felt. Yet the Lord alternately bestows and withdraws his touch that he might gradually train them to be weaned from sensation and walk by faith. These do not understand the way of the Lord, however, and conclude that their spiritual condition is highest when they can feel the Lord's presence and lowest when they fail to do so. In other words, they think God is present when they can feel him. They think God is an experience that you have or something that you feel rather than someone that you know. And he goes on to say this. Emotion is what believers mistake for spirituality. Carnal Christians whose tendency is emotional in character habitually crave sensation in their lives. In other words, they want to feel something. They want an experience. They're looking for a better feeling and a better experience than they got the last time, a bigger high. Back to knee. They desire to sense the presence of God in their hearts or their sensory organs, They yearn to feel love fire burning. They want to feel elated, to be uplifted in spiritual life, to be prosperous in work. True spiritual believers do sometimes have such sensations. Yet their progress and joy are not contingent upon these. In other words, people who really walk with the Lord have experiences too. They have time when their feelings are just outstanding, but they don't need either. Why? Because their spiritual life is not driven by anything going on outside of them. Their spiritual life is being driven by who lives inside of them. That's a completely different thing. So what does Nee say? Remember, we're talking about emotions being deceitful. The soul needs outward stimuli to feel something. The spirit needs nothing external because it's driven internally by the Holy Spirit. The soul is a part of the flesh. Worship from the soul in the flesh is driven by things that we see, photo and video that stirs us, sounds that we hear, music that moves us, or touching stories that inspire us. The right combination of stimuli creates an emotional experience, a feeling that some mistake to be God or his presence. Now listen real closely. Real worship is deeper than emotions, even though it can result in emotions. Did you get that? It's deeper than emotions, but it can really result in emotions. Real worship is deeper than our thoughts, our thinking, but we experience in our thoughts, in our thinking. 
Real worship needs no external stimuli, none, zip, zero. It doesn't need the proper setting, a nice cool room, uh, theatrical lighting, cool stage. It doesn't need beautiful visuals. It doesn't need our kind of music. It just needs God and his truth. Now listen closely. If the words of the song just being read don't bring you to worship, then you didn't worship when you felt something singing it with the music. I'll say that again. If the words of the song just being read don't bring you to worship, then you didn't really worship when you felt something singing it. High notes hit and held, gospel music. Key changes, we just had one. And other uses of music can create feelings. Those feelings are feelings. They're not worship. If you can't and don't worship without these externals, then whatever you felt wasn't really worship. Now, I'm about to do a really poor job at what I'm about to do, but I hope it'll get across. Probably all of us have been stirred by some preacher who would get on a dramatic row with biblical truths. There's a guy, a black preacher by the name of Lockridge, who does this thing. It's just when it's over with, you want to stand up and cheer. I'm not a performer, but I'm going to try to do a weak example of this. It's a poem that some of you are familiar with, maybe most of you. And it goes like this. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of Christ, and I'll not look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. I am a disciple of Christ. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I am a disciple of Christ who has finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, pain vision, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarf goals. I'm a disciple of Christ and no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, plaudits, or popularity. I'm a disciple of Christ and do not have to be first, top, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. I'm a disciple of Christ and lean on Christ's presence, walk by faith, am uplifted by prayer and labor by his power. I'm a disciple of Christ. My faith is fixed. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. I'm a disciple of Christ and my companions are few. My guide is reliable. My mission is clear. I'm a disciple of Christ and I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I'm a disciple of Christ who will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I'm a disciple of Christ and I will not give up, shut up, or let up until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and taught up for the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Christ and must go until he comes, give until I drop, teach until I know, and work until he stops me. When Christ comes for me, I will have no problem, he'll have no problem recognizing me. My title will be clear, for I am a disciple of Christ. <clears throat> now, thank you, and you just proved my point. I'm not any good at this, but you likely feel a little stirred up right now. Some preachers are really great at stirring people up, firing up the soul. Not the spirit, the soul. They make you feel, as the saying goes, that you could charge hell with a water pistol. There's nothing wrong with feeling something after what I just read. Here's the point, though. What should stir you is that it describes your commitment to God Whatever your feelings may be right now or in the future, not how I said it or how it, was ma it made you to feel. Listen closely. If your response was from the spirit instead of the soul, then I could have read those words with no cadence, no emotion, no volume, and your spirit would scream, yes! Yes! Did you understand what I just said? 
If you require a band, a choir, and a praise team, and some great harmonies to worship, you're not worshiping. If you can't just pick up a hymnal and read it and worship without any music, you're not worshiping. The worship is not in the music. Now, music's a wonderful thing. I love it. I'm a, I'm a big, big, big music guy. Music gives us an avenue to express what comes out of the Spirit, but what happens is it becomes a substitute for the Spirit. And it becomes something we, we, we feel in our souls, not something that comes out of our spirits. So we go to church and say, well, I really like the music. Well, that's not the question. Did you like the doctrine? You worship because of the doctrine, not because of the music or the music style. If you pick a church because the music, it's completely out of the soul. I'd go to church where I hated the music if the guy was preaching the truth. If you're, you were not moved externally, but you were moved internally. Yes! How many of you have heard of the, the, the uh, sermon, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God? the most famous sermon ever by a guy named Jonathan Edwards. When he, he, when he preached this message, people passed out. People wore, supposedly wore grooves in the pews. They were gripping them so hard. You think, oh, Jonathan Edwards must have been a young guy just jumping around and firing people up and hacking and whatever else. Jonathan Edwards was an old man reading by candlelight. But what he said was the truth, and the power was in the truth. The power was not in the preacher's performance. Can I get amen, Greg Stevens? If you're looking for a performing preacher, you ain't, this ain't the place. If you're looking for the whole truth, nothing but the truth, you found it. If you attend a great concert of a band you love, you'll experience euphoric feelings. How many of you are Eagle fans? Okay, go, go listen to, watch the Eagles at a concert. You're going to leave with a peaceful, easy feeling, right? <clears throat> You'll feel the same euphoria at church. Some think it's God showing up or being there. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. For somebody to pray, God, we invite you in this service. That's heresy. God is here. He's omnipresent. He's here because he lives in me. He's here because he lives in you. If two or three are there in his presence, he's there, right? You'll ask God to come. He's here. He's here whether you feel like it or not. God's everywhere. He can't show up because he's already here. To think that God's only here when they feel something, listen, is to reduce the almighty, unchanging God to your ever-changing emotions. Almost any decent movie will set you up with a scene that will move you emotionally. I watched Toy Story 4 on the way back on the airplane. And there were two times I wanted to cry. <laughs> See, it was a God moment. God was there on the airplane with me. <laughs> no, it was emotional feelings that were intended and designed to be drawn out of me by the people who wrote that movie and wrote that music. It's exactly what it was. We walk by faith, not by sight. We don't, need, we don't need to feel something because we know someone. We don't have to feel God's love because we believe in God's love. I don't have to feel that he's good right now, how things are going, because I know that he's good, no matter how things are going. Are you getting this? Our emotions are the most deceitful part of us. The. Our emotions are the most undependable part of us. So you're going to live your Christian life out of your emotions? Now again, am I saying emotions are bad? No. They're wonderful when they're a result of walking out of the Spirit. Little s filled with a big S. But they can become a clever, manipulative substitute for walking in the Spirit. And we start to interpret God's presence by how we feel.
by whether or not we worship by whether we like the music or you had a beat you could clap to or whatever else somebody's gig is. Our walk with God is based upon His unchanging character and word, not upon our unpredictable, ever-changing emotions. Nee once again said this, Soulish believers have numerous sentimental experiences which induce them to deem themselves to be more spiritual, not realizing that these are but evidence of their being carnal. Wow. Our physical desires and our damaged souls constitute what the Bible calls our flesh, our old nature. Our desires are distorted, our emotions are deceitful. Now, remember this. Watchman Nee wrote what he wrote from a communist prison where he's on death row, where he eventually died. He didn't write this from some beach resort in Tahiti. He had no desirable externals to make him feel God's love or his presence. He had every logical reason instead to doubt God's love and doubt God's presence. But he was, wasn't walking by sight. He was walking by faith. He wasn't trying to live the Christian life out of the soul. Well, what do I think about this? How do I feel right now? He was living his Christian life out of the spirit, which is driven by the word and the Holy Spirit. Paul was persecuted, his whole ministry eventually was executed for following Jesus. He wrote many of the letters from a Roman prison. Now again, this is 2,000 years ago. Roman prisons weren't these country club prisons that we build in America now. The, the conditions were deplorable. Paul had every reason to doubt God's love and his goodness not to believe in them. But he didn't walk by sight, he walked by faith. He wasn't driven by his soul and external things determining what he would think about God. He was driven by his spirit, internal things that he knew to be true about God because they were based on his unchanging true word, not on his ever-changing, unpredictable circumstances. From there, he wrote the book to the Philippians, who weren't in jail, about how to have God's joy. Obviously, God's joy comes from the Spirit, not the soul. God's only, Paul's only good circumstance at the moment was that they hadn't killed him yet. But that in no way changed Paul. Why? Because when you walk in the Spirit, externals have nothing to do with it. The whole world says we don't believe in God anymore. So? At high school, everybody else is doing it. So? That has nothing to do with me. I'm driven internally by the Holy Spirit who inhabits my spirit. I don't need to feel anything. What I, what, what I am and what I know is based on God's truth, not my logic and reasoning. In Matthew 11, 1 to, uh, 1 to 11, John the Baptist, is in, he's been uh, jailed. He sends a delegation, Jesus, asking Jesus to get him out of jail. Well, that's what he's looking for. And Jesus didn't do it. He left John there, and John soon thereafter was beheaded by Herod. You can read about that in Matthew 14. If John was living out of his soul, his faith in Jesus would have been shattered. I'm sure John was praying, God, get me out of this jail. God didn't answer that prayer. God got him to heaven sooner. But God still is a God of love. Why? Because John believed in that. He didn't have to feel it. He's a good God. Does John believe that? So John gets beheaded soon thereafter. He did, but he never, his faith wasn't shattered. Jesus said he was the greatest man that was ever born. Wow. Number three. We're talking about now our minds are being deluded. Our minds are deluded. Ephesians 2, 3 says that we all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. Now watch this. Indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. He's putting those two together. Notice in this verse that our minds are on the same level as the flesh. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our thinking is not his thinking. Proverbs 16, 25 says, There's a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. 
We can think we're right and be completely wrong. In Matthew 7, the many who are going to miss heaven all think they're going. They're sure they're going. And they're mistaken and they're wrong. How could they be wrong about such a big thing? Because our minds are deluded. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 tells us that the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Those who think they cannot be deceived are those most easily deceived. Those who acknowledge that they can be deceived are those least likely to be deceived. Did you get that? Jot down 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Let him who thinks he stand take heed that he does not fall. Think you can stand? You'll probably fall. Know you can fall? You, you can really stand now. Watch me knee again. According to the Bible... The works of the flesh are of two kinds, though both are of the flesh. The unrighteous and the self-righteous. The flesh can produce, uh, can produce not only defiling sins, but also commendable morals. Not only the base and the ignorable, but the high and noble as well. Not only sinful lust, but good intention too, end of quote. He goes on to say this, aside from sin, what grieves God the most as well as what harms people the deepest is to walk and labor according to our own life to live out the soul. The first and original sin of man was to seek what is good, wise, and intellectual according to his own idea. Being created in God's image, man has good in him. When man considers himself to be good rather than sinful, he fails to realize that his goodness is not good enough in God's eyes, and that that keeps him from abandoning his self-confidence and surrendering to the one who is good. It was the good of Nicodemus that was his problem, not his sin. It was the good of the rich young ruler, not his sin, that was his problem. The Pharisee who prayed and said, I'm glad I'm not like that filthy tax tax collector. His problem was not his sin. His big problem was his good. Is this making sense? So I can live out of my soul and be a pretty good man. I can come to church and be a part of the Christmas party. I can, be, I can do some good things. I can give some money to support a missionary. I, that's, a, that's a nice thing. And, and I did it, and I felt real good about myself doing it. Our flesh has disordered, distorted desires, deceitful emotions, and deluded minds. A lot of, quote, good people are going to miss heaven because of a deluded confidence in their own minds, in their own souls, that they're okay. Now, here's number four. Our wills are damaged. Our wills are damaged. All of these things, these four things are part of our flesh. So 7, 15, and 18 of Romans uh, 7. I'm not practicing what I'd like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. For I know that nothing good dwells in my flesh, that is, that is, dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Human good dwells in our flesh. Godly good does not. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. This is true. Even lost people can feel good when they give. Lost people can get all in on what they believe to be a worthy cause. And a lot of churches have begun to attract people who are living out of their souls. They've not been reborn in the Spirit because they love a good cause. So this church is about social justice, and I like about social justice. And so I go jump into social justice. I'm all about this church because we're doing something about these social injustices. And it never enters their mind that God has never entered their spirit. They talk Christian, they act Christian, they do Christian things, but they're not Christians. You can feel good about doing good and about being good, and in your own mind, at least you're better than other people. 2 Timothy 2.26 says the devil holds people captive to do his will. 
our wills are damaged. Now, let me explain the science, if you will, of obedience and disobedience. Blake, can we get that uh, graphic back up or whoever's doing the graphics? So here's the deal. Satan tempts us, the one with body, soul, and spirit. Thank you. Satan tempts us through the flesh. We have physical cravings for food, for highs, for sex. What the devil entices us to do. By the way, the forbidden fruit was good for food. And then we have emotions about what it would feel like to do those things. It was good to the eyes. And then Proverbs 27, 20 says that the eyes, literally the desires, what, what he wants, the eyes of a man are never satisfied. And then we think about immediate gratification and pleasure. It would make them wise if they took of this fruit. When your body wants something and your mind and emotions line up with it, you'll be double teamed and you'll give in to temptation. Physical desire plus emotional desire plus wrong thinking equals a will that is dominated by the flesh. My body, this is what I want. My emotions, I tend to want what my body wants, not what I ought to want, right? My mind, I'm thinking, you know what, it'll be good to do that. And so all those three line up against my will. I do not have a choice. I'm an addict. I'm controlled. I'm helpless. I'm a victim of my flesh. God prompts us to do his will through his spirit. And in our spirit, our physical craving will almost always be contrary to what God wants. Our emotions will almost always, until you get them retrained over a long period of time, Want to gratify yourself and experience pleasure, relief, or escape. Our minds, therefore, have to be renewed so that now we think as God thinks so that we'll want to do what God wants us to do. A renewed mind knows that God's will is ultimately better and that sin is never better long term. So now I'm going to get in, your, in, in some of your level. I'm going to talk about wrestling, Okay. Wrestling terms, here's how it ends up if we're walking in the Spirit. In one corner, we have the tag team of the physical desires of the body and the self-serving nature of emotions. They're coached by the devil himself. In the other corner, we have the renewed mind and a regenerated spirit coached by God himself. Now let's jump illustrations, let's go back to the cartoon character. On one shoulder is a little demon-looking guy with your face and your voice telling you to do what feels good right now. What is wrong? On the other shoulder is a little angelic-looking uh, guy with your face and your voice telling you to do what might be difficult to do right now, but is the right thing to do. So you say, who wins? Well, you choose. Now, until your mind has been renewed, you don't have the choice. You're going down. But once you renew your mind and your mind goes over and teams up with regenerated spirit, now you have the freedom to choose and do the right thing and quit be, being a victim of your appetite, your desires, and whatever else has you, uh, has you trapped and addicted. Obedience always boils down to choosing what God wants you to do. More often than not, it's choosing against what I feel like doing. If I'm living out my soul, I'm going to do what I feel like doing. When I'm living out my spirit, I'm forever not doing what I feel like doing. I mean, somebody cuts me off in traffic, I either want to run him off the road into a ditch, that would be plan A, or plan B, I want to tell him he's number one. Okay? That may be what I feel like doing. But if I'm walking in the Spirit, what does, I, what does what I feel like doing have anything to do with what I ought to do? Nothing. I ought to be driven by who God wants me to be, not by any external circumstance trying to affect how I would think, feel, and what I would do. More often than not, obedience to God is delaying gratification. It's sowing seed now for a benefit you'll derive later. Sin pays you now, but it costs you later. Righteousness almost always costs you now and pays you later. I need my, my spirit 
to be reborn by God's Spirit. I need my mind to be transformed and renewed by God's Word. Then his thoughts will start to become my thoughts. The flesh will continue to wage war against the Spirit, but because of God's Spirit in my spirit, I can obey him. Romans 8, 11 says that the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. You're here battling something, some addiction or something else you hadn't been able to kick. Your problem is if you're a Christian, you don't know who you are. God himself dwells in you. And in case you don't know, that's enough power to beat whatever you're facing. You've just got to quit living out of the soul and start to learn how to live out of the spirit. Because of a renewed mind, I know what I, that I should obey God. With the power that God's Spirit gives and the perspective that God's Word gives, my will is now free to choose to do what God wants me to do even when I don't feel like doing it. Going back to a verse we read earlier, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh.